Hello, welcome back to theCUBE here in New York City. I'm John Furrier, your host. This is our East Coast studio at the NYSC, partnering with the NYSC Wired community, getting all that content open source, connecting Silicon Valley and Wall Street, creating a network of, of experts, entrepreneurs, innovators in technology, certainly in general AI. And we have here Brian Harris, the CTO of SaaS. CUBE alumni, great to see you doing a tour in New York, visiting customers. Um, good to see you in the studio. Welcome to our new set here. Thank you, John. This is an unbelievable backdrop here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, a historic location, right? And the, the pinnacle of, uh, of, it, of capitals. It's the center. What's interesting about the NYSE is that, like I've noticed since we've been coming here, is that like all the luminaries come in here and give talks. When I was here, uh, when the UN was here, just ironically, it's like we were doing a media week, the president of the EU was here. Just, it's a, they give speeches. We had the women's basketball team with the trophy okay. here. It's just, it's the center of action. Right? Yeah. And, and having a studio is great, but more importantly in New York, there's a lot of customers here, a lot of entrepreneurs. I know you guys have a, a lot of customers in New York. Yeah, yeah. This is, it's becoming a tech hub, like Raleigh is in the Research Triangle Park area where you guys are. So yeah. you have these tech pockets yeah. um, forming. So it's really fun. Um, well, I want to get with you because you guys just had a great SaaS championship with all your top customers. It was always a marquee event. But you gave a presentation um, to the customers. I was attending that about um, the generative AI stuff that you're working on. You guys put in a billion dollars of investment into yeah. innovating and infusing Gen AI in all your products. You're a leader in, in, in uh, analytics, going back to the history, Dr. Goodnight. And we're in a wave where it's looking like a quote you said on the Cube uh, a year and a half ago was people who have data, and if it's basically manage okay, yeah. AI is going to make it great. Yeah. Okay, something to that effect. We're kind of in that post hype mode where it's like, yeah. where's the rubber meeting the road? Where's the fruit coming off the trees? What are you seeing right now? Because you're in the middle of this, you've got product people are using, you're throwing off a lot of data, you're working on the models. What's going on with the reality of Gen AI right now? Well, I, I think that uh, the reality is that people are figuring out where, where it really has impact and where it, it can't actually. And we're seeing that there's, it has a incredible strengths with unstructured data, slow moving knowledge, right? Things like that. Uh, it really starts to get complicated and more, more dicier, I would say, when you talk about quantitative analysis. And so one of the things that we are doing in our research, all of our research is how do we have this seamless experience with generative AI that allows us to use the LLMs for the strength that they provide, but also have the callbacks into our SaaS VIA platform, which is our data and AI platform, to kind of do all the quantitative analysis that is really the majority of analytics and AI in the world right now. For like banks and, yeah. uh, and, and doing things like fraud detection, anti-money laundering detection, um, and, and any other type of just broader, like you know, customer churn models, uh, recommend, recommendation engines. There's just a lot of quantitative analysis, yet we love this human natural language interaction we get with generative AI. So yeah. it's really about understanding what are its strengths, where are its weaknesses, yeah. and how do you build hybrid architectures that allow you to do both? You know, you guys have a great product management team. Hats off, because we've been covering your event now for a couple of years. Appreciate that. Um, talk about the platform you guys have and where it's going, because you guys went on a, a strategic direction saying, we have a lot of products out there in the portfolio, yeah. but we're going to build a platform yeah. to try to build some common set of services around um, efficiency, around the tooling, around some of the apps yeah. that are involved. And now you have models, yeah, you have AI models as well. Give an update on the platform origination thoughts yeah. and where it is today. Well, let's start with, you know, we're a company, it's about 48 years old. And so we've had a huge history. We've been running neural networks for 25 years. So we know this space really, really well. But the, obviously the challenge with the company that's been, you know, in the market success for this long is unifying the software stack. And so one of the things I came when I, when I came and took over the CTO role in 2021, it was my mission is to unify our platform, which is really, we think of it as three buying motions for AI. If you need to build AI, then we've got a platform for you to do that. If you want to go and improve the cost of the business or efficiency, we have out of the box solutions built on that same tech stack that can address issues like um, asset liability management, um, or it might be in the life sciences industry for clinical submissions. Uh, we have the, the IP and the expertise in that space. And the new area we added this year were, was just independent models. One of the best parts about the generative AI market is that it has conditioned uh, the, 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 the entire industry to think about foundational models. Now, most of those foundational models today are all about you know, uh, you know, large language models. Yeah. What we believe is there's a whole massive billion dollar market for foundational models that are more um, in traditional AI, deterministic models. You run the model 
a hundred times, you get the same exact answer. Um, and this is what happens in banking, this is what happens in, you know, uh, in life sciences industries, insurance industries, government, what's so on and so forth. So for us, it's that whole billion dollar investment is really around unifying that entire software stack, mm -hmm. making it cloud native and seamless where we can run uniquely, we can run uh, on a customer's tenant, right? We can host it ourselves if we want to with, as far as uh, our cloud managed services for that, or we can run it actually on-prem so we can go onto a Colo or even on your just uh, raw hardware, right? So, right, and we'll, yeah. we'll run uh, Kubernetes on there for you, open source or open stack. And so all environments all at the same time. Yes, and what we believe now, what we're so excited about is that it gives the control back to the customer. So if you want to think about how you're going to spend your money, whether you think this is something that should be run in the cloud, mm -hmm. that's your choice. If you want to go and maybe turn it into a CapEx cost, you can do that and run it on, on your data center or your colo. Yeah. And, that, and that allows you to kind of really think about the cost curve of AI in the business more effectively. Yeah, and that's been the dream scenario. Um, if you go back even eight years, I think it was public cloud, but now yeah. you have multiple environments. You know, one of the things I want to get to is the models. And I, we just wrote a post on SiliconANGLE, breaking analysis, Dave Vellante, George Gilbert, myself put it out there. Titles, why Jamie Dimon is Sam Altman's biggest competitor. <laughs> so it's, we better throw J Jamie Dimon and Sam, Altman, just look at a little clickbait in there, yeah. get some attention. But we were highlighting the fact that if you look at all the data that OpenAI has ingested, yeah. the, the web, we all see that, Jamie Dimon's sitting on petabytes yes. and petabytes and petabytes yep. of private data. He's not going to put that in with OpenAI, right? So he's got a yeah. huge competitive advantage. So you start to see now mainstream recognition in the tech industry, Brian. And again, we've talked about it on the Cube with you guys that I have IP in my data. Oh yeah. Okay, and I want to run that. Yes. And so I need maximum flexibility to run my platform in multiple environments, like you just pointed out. But now I got to make my models work yes. for me. I don't want that leaking out into OpenAI, and I might use them through an API. But for me, I have my own ChatGPT. Yeah. There's a whole set of callback architectures where you're going out to the LLM and then once you know you're you're asking a question that requires uh, data of the sensitivity, you you, you basically return the control back to your environment and then execute all the AI you need inside of that, you know, in a computational way or in a, um, a numerical way in a sense and quantitatively. So I think for us, we this comes back to your earlier statement around the data is everything, right? And so it's actually a big reason why we are moving heavily into synthetic data. Uh, we have got some of the most uh, exciting things yeah. coming uh, very soon to the market on synthetic data because yeah. it low the lowering the the um, data uh, the acquisition costs of creating data then it gives you a competitive advantage to create models so that you can actually deploy those models into production and and, and I'll tell you real quick sorry I just want to say that one of the biggest challenges in this is that when you're dealing with models that have to deal with rare events like fraud that you, you don't want to have your innovation to be at the rate of how many fraud cases get by you. Yeah. Right, you want to base, you want to create scenarios and simulate future scenarios yeah. with synthetic data, so you can create better models that are more robust, and that can yeah. actually can. Uh, you know, be I know effective. you've been big in this digital twin yeah. category, and you Very guys have that so. up and running. We just wrote um, two months ago in the print version for Economist a big spread of Cube Research put up on digital twins, not just being a manufacturing thing. Oh, not at all. Of course, yeah. manufacturing, big, that's where yeah. everyone uses it, it's great. Well, they, it's very clear. Very clear, yeah, you yeah. simulate, you get zero yeah. defects, you can do all these cool yeah. things. But the notion of simulation is every vertical, every yes. department, marketing, yes. sales. If you bolt on a digital twin, yeah. you can actually get business benefits because now for the first time, you can actually map what you're trying yeah. to get efficiencies. It's not just manufacturing, marketing, yeah. maybe who's the right customer or sales is the right pitch. I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but this is important because this is where the productivity, a key part of the stats you've been rolling yeah. out. Talk about that dynamic of simulating, uh, whether it's real data, um, synthetic data, if you can't get enough yeah, data, right. and then this productivity uh, outcome. Yeah, so I, I, I really boil it down to this concept, this metric I call the learning rate of an organization. All right, if you think about it, I'm using, we're going to help organizations with data and AI to make better decisions and ultimately achieve better outcomes. The rate at which you're doing that is your learning rate for the organization. If your learning rate is faster than everyone else's, then you have created a competitive advantage. Because <laughs> if you think about your competitors, you're looking at the same data yeah. environment. So the more you can rev through that entire data and AI lifecycle, the faster you can do that, yeah. the more you are creating a, a competitive advantage between you and everyone else in your entire space. Kind of like cash flow and growth yeah. rate. Yeah. More cash flow, 
Yeah. Better growth rate. Yeah. yeah. And better so, data, better productivity rate. That's right. And so recently we, we had two studies we've done, independent studies, one uh, both by the Futurum group. So first was it just about speed. How do we how can we compare our our, our via uh, platform just computationally in the cloud so that we can uh, talk about real ROI and cost savings, right? TCO in the cloud. And when we went through that study, we were identified as 30 times, on average, 30 times faster across 1,500 tests, um, narrow data, wide data, deep data, all of it. We were 30 times faster than open source and uh, commercial alternative. And uh, when you look, at, just compare us against the commercial alternative, we were 49 times faster. And in the advanced analytics stuff, we were 326 times faster. So that translates to real dollars back to C-level, you know, in, the, in the organization, back to the CFO. We can return you cost, you know, cost savings by using our software. Then we said, okay, well, that's fine. You're, 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 you're training models faster. What about the whole process of going through the data wrangling to the data modeling to the model ops lifecycle? Yeah. We just ran that study. That just came out about a month ago. And we had independent people use our yeah. software and others and they went through all the entire life cycle now. We were identified, Sasfi was identified as over four and a half times more productive. Just on the data engineering side, we were 16 times more productive yeah. just doing that work. On the modeling side, we were three and a half times, and on the model ops side, we were 4.6 yeah. times faster. So when you think about it- you Clear do, benefit on productivity. No, when you net it out, we, our, our argument back to everyone is that, look, with, with Sasfi, you're, you're not only are your, is your model training faster, but yeah. your teams work faster. And so it's really, if you look at it as a two-dimensional two matrix, yeah. the cost of a, of a company is their, their cloud costs and AI and their people. And we're reducing both dimensions simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, every company, that's why the Jamie Diamond post I posted was because like, every company will be JP Morgan. Yeah. Everyone will have models. Yeah. They got to be fine-tuned. They got to be trained. They got to be inferring and reinforced yeah. learning. Everyone is unlo trying to unlock value yeah. out of their data. I think you put up a good point. I've been saying this on theCUBE that this, the bubble is not going to burst like the dot-com bubble because those things needed to happen over time, yeah. over evolution. The AI wave is going to be maybe a little air coming out of the hype balloons already yeah. kind of happened, but there's too many low hanging fruit scenarios to get right now. Yes. I mean, every area, code generation, yes. code assistant, co-pilots, productivity, everywhere you look, anyone yeah. with a half a brain could probably go in there and knock something down. Definitely. It could be Jira tickets. It could be something we, we in do DevOps. That. We're it actually could... doing that work. We're using generative AI internally to go look at Jira tickets and tech support and then uh, zero in on root cause analysis that might be spanning multiple yeah. issues. Cybersecurity. Yeah. I mean, every, and then you said on the Cube two years ago, I asked you this question, which industries, uh, which areas are most um, um, set up for Gen AI? You said regulated industries because yes. they have the data. Well, they have the is, data, actually what I think, it, it does, they have the data, but what they have is the policies of wh to which their empl employees of a company need to be compliant to those regulations. That's a perfect scenario where as you're doing your work, an LLM, can, an agent can be going out and querying yeah. the, the, the regulatory compliance framework yeah. and, then, and, and, and then validating whether as you yeah. go along, you're doing yeah. the right thing to be compliant. It's like training. If you have the book already written, just yeah. learn the book. Yes. Here, AI yeah. just learns the book. Yeah, the, and, the, and, and the it language. helps you. It's behind the scenes telling you, by the way, we're doing this for like uh, police investigations. Yeah. If we understand the police regulatory framework that we're lo looking at, yeah. as we go and uh, help, we have one of our, our visual investigators, one of our really um, very, very cool applications and solutions that allows customers to kind of do investigative workflows. Yeah. We can integrate in the regulatory policing frameworks into that workflow so that when they build a case, yeah. the case has got is compliant to the regulatories. Uh, what I regulatory. like about what you're, you guys are doing is, and you you brought it up with the, these examples. Structured data is good. Semi-structured data is good. Unstructured data, you do them all. Yes, you do them all. Yeah. But you put them together for the first time in history. Yeah. You don't need to build three yeah. separate silos. You guys yeah. have one yeah. abstraction, we, and so I can ingest policies from say. Um, a um, access control policy from mm -hmm. some well-formed system, yeah. learn it, yep. never have to deal with it again, now it's in the, the so-called Gen AI brain. Yep, and, and I would even say that there's another category which is the uh, uh, the kind of the PDF world, right? The the uh, unstructured, you know, image yeah. uh, images of the documents, picture. right? Right. So we just released our one of our first models out of our yeah. model organization, it was our document analysis uh, model. 
and we can send it in, it'll OCR, extract all the metadata, turn it into structured data, yeah. and that's now gonna be applied to a bunch of domains in the medical industry, as well as fraud and government. Yeah. And so, just released that actually in Q3 of this year. You know, I love talking with you guys, and as I get to know your company more and more, it's just, it's a, it's a treasure trove of knowledge and great people. You guys have a lot of customers. The proof is, not, it's a private company. Yeah. Dr. Goodnight, the founder, um, is like, I, I look at him like a Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard kind of statesman in the industry, because, I mean, what a great entrepreneurial venture yes. that's been. Stay private, but being private, you're not out in the public markets. Yeah. Obviously, we're here in the stock exchange. Um, the success you guys have had as a company has been amazing. And now with Gen AI, it's just a perfect opportunity and you're spending a billion dollars to put innovation in there. Where in your mind, obviously you're architecting the platform and the team's mm -hmm. doing great. You got Innovate coming up. Yeah. You got a company that is well positioned. It's firing on all pistons. Yeah. When you're out in the market, are, how's it going with customers? And like, how's this converting? How are those regulated industries doing? How are some of the customer solutions rolling out? And what's coming? What's next? Because you guys keep pouring it on. Give us a yeah. taste of like yeah, yeah. where we are right now with the SaaS innovation strategy. Well, I think first of all, like I said, if you think of the, the whole portfolio, it's really three categories, platform, solutions, and models. We're about to explode with models. Like that's the thing that we are really starting to look at. That's a big deal because it really lowers the barrier for integrating AI into yeah. existing yeah. businesses. We're going to allow you to just pull a model down, deploy it uh, via an, a REST API in your organization, and you can uh, com continue uh, to just you know incrementally add value to your existing business process without kind of re-engineering yeah. everything. Yeah. And that's a huge upside. We're seeing tremendous feedback now from the customers. Uh, synthetic data for us, you're going to see a continued conversation about this in the market over the next very uh, next uh, I would say month to. Uh, six months, you're going to see a continued dialogue yeah. around what we're doing in synthetic data. Very, very pioneering stuff there. I mentioned earlier, uh, we already have now exciting uh, um, in, uh, collaboration on quantum computing. Uh, so we're doing some incredibly pioneering work yeah. on quantum where we're doing hybrid architectures where we use quantum to really just as an accelerator for optimization problems. We kind of basically scan the entire search space with com quantum computers and then it feed the outcomes as really the, if you will, the, the starting, the best solutions for the traditional solvers in optimization problems. So this hybrid model is showing incredible progress and we have customers now who are engaging with us on this. So, so. you're preparing for the quantum wave. So the yeah. supercomputing wave is now Gen AI because it's yeah. HPC meets super clusters, basically yeah. with NVIDIA and chips. And that world is really, what we see is that world is, is going to be a continuous optimization of the architectures. RAG is, still has its challenges. It's yeah. not perfect. Yeah. It's good, it's not perfect. And I think you're gonna, we're going to see more evolution of how we do RAG effectively with low latency uh, and, and obviously the chunking size, all things related to that yeah. for, for bringing kind of outside data to the LLM. That just going to continue to evolve on yeah, it. Yeah. So I think that, I think what one for us as a company, the, the opportunity we're seeing right now that is really, really exciting. We just had a, a very large bank uh, kind of prove this out for us. When we solve one problem in the business, the, the, the flexibility and the scalability of our software is allowing us to solve like a dozen other problems in the business. And that is and incredible. And that's a benefit from the stack being modernized under the platform. Cloud native, Kubernetes driven, it, fit the, it fits the IT operator's needs. Yeah. It, and, and we can quickly build uh, capabilities that, um, you know, you're talking like, you know, 90 days, you're, you're up and running in production if you want to. It could be early in that. A lot of times it's just got to go through the yeah. process of the of a, of a customer's environment. But we can turn things around yeah. exceptionally fast. And when you think about Every customer I talk to is looking about how they can streamline their vendor ecosystem. We don't want to have 50 vendors. I don't want to have 50 tools. How can you help us solve more of our business problems, right? And the win is they can reduce their costs. The platform and, does that for them. Yeah, and we the platform plus our solutions and yeah. models, they can choose where they want it. If they have a bunch of data scientists on a core problem, our platform's perfect. They can build with it and they can do yeah. massive model tournaments and train unique new models for themselves. If they want a solution that lowers the cost of part of the business, buy the solution. If you want to put a model into a maybe a supply chain optimization strategy, yeah. deploy the model. We give them the flexibility and specifically we can deploy that anywhere across the environments, cloud, customer uh, customer tenant in their own cloud or as well uh, on-prem. Yeah, that's a good point that you brought up. I want to get your reaction. I know you got to go to, to, a, right. to a meeting. But the ecosystem concept of partners and vendors there's been an ecosystem discussion, SaaS, we saw that. We're seeing on our data this idea of connected ecosystem. Yeah. And we see a lot of the big players that have platforms playing, I call small ball. They're not mm. trying to get all the logos. Yeah. They get the right logos because it's not just connecting with the API, there's a lot of 
platform integrations. Yes. Because now we're talking about generative AI where I might have to go across an API oh, to a delegated yeah. trusted source yes. and do something. Yep. That is a runtime low latency scenario. Yeah. So this idea of connecting the partners. Yeah. What's your view on that as you look at your VIA platform, which has the platform solutions and models, as you have people connect into you? What does that connected ecosystem look like? Is that something that you're seeing as well? Yes. And what are some of those requirements? Is, like I say small ball because you got to engineer in. No, yeah. I mean, you, the day of, of telling a customer rip and replace everything is this, this doesn't exist. The, the, the sprawl of technology is pretty large now mm -hmm. as, as companies have adopted it. And as a result, it is about fit. Yeah. How do you fit into the ecosystem and yeah. what role does the company want to see you in yeah. as they put you in there? So for us, yeah. one of the products that does this consistently is our, uh, so it's called intelligent decisioning. That's under it's on our via platform, and it, it really allows us to integrate AI models in in the context of uh, kind of decision flows. So you could have very sophisticated decision flows. We have banks making billions of dollars lending decisions through these things, but what it can do is orchestrate all these calls. It can orchestrate out to an LLM. Yeah. It can orchestrate out to another system. Orchestrate out to a database. Yeah. It can then and run embedded models, yeah. and we can we can take that whole flow, export it out to a single container and execute it with 30 millisecond latency. Well, Brian, I wish I had more time. I'm bogarting all your time here on theCUBE. <laughs> I know you got to go to other important meetings and uh, as, you, as you run the company with your team, you've done an incredible job. The platforms are here. It's clear that it's platforms connecting to other platforms. Gen AI is clearly working. Final 30 seconds, what should people know about SaaS? Um, what's the update? What's the modern version? If someone's saying, hey, I've been looking at SaaS. What, what, what would you tell them? and give, give us a preview of Innovate coming up. Well, I would say that we are we are uh, a data and AI company with one of the most productive and fastest platform solution ecosystems you've ever seen. Uh, we're proving that independently. And so we are putting our, you know, put it, we're putting it out there and testing it independently to prove those claims. And so I would say that for those who think that we are just a language because of our history, we are competing on that productivity and performance and trust of our, the way we deliver results with AI. And as a result of that, our goal really is to uh, let you know that with your open source language, Python and R, we're going to deliver the same value proposition that we deliver for our language with, with SAS's programming language. So really, to me, it's about how do we enable customers to do more faster with AI in production with our, for, their, for their business. And Innovate coming up. What's the, give me a little tease on Innovate. The you're theme. going to see some <laughs> wild things that innovate. You're going to see great work on synthetic data. You're going to see stuff with gaming engines that, that we've talked about. <laughs> yeah. And I've got I've a demo seen. coming up internally with my R&D team uh, in, in a couple of weeks. And it, this is going to blow people's minds on how right. we're now using gaming engines to create simulated environments to also create yeah. synthetic data and bootstrap models. So that's just part of it. And yeah. you're going to see incredible outcomes on our yeah. overall A fun event. Check software. out SAS Innovate. Again, Brian, thanks for coming on. I know we got a busy schedule. And thanks for kicking off our inaugural Cube and East Coast uh, uh, fall window. We're going to be full time and starting next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll certainly have you on again. Well, thank sure. you. It's always yeah. a pleasure. Tom. All right. All cool. right. Thanks thank for you. Bye-bye. Brian Harris, CTO at SAS. Again, leading the charge. Transformation's everywhere, but the value has to be there for customers. This is what productivity is going to be all about. Extending into other value. Once you figure things out, new value just appears. Jeremy has that magic. Check it out. I'm John Furrier, your host here on theCUBE. We'll be right back.